Hi. So in this talk, uh, we'd like to take you on a journey across the environmental materiality of digital services. So the speakers in front of you is David. My name is Benoit. We are contributors to a, an NGO called Boa Vista uh, that we'll present briefly later. Uh, we also are colleagues uh, in a small company called Hublot working on ICT environmental impacts. Regarding Boa Vista, so the, the NGO we work for and uh, the, this is the work of this NGO we present to you today. Um, this is an NGO based in France uh, that uh, gathers more than 250 members now, private companies, public organizations, universities, researchers, freelancers, and so on. Uh, and the goal of the organization is to provide uh, public and open methods, data, tools, and knowledge uh, about environmental impacts uh, of ICT and its asset assessment. Uh, and of course, we try to provide a useful open source, open data, and open science um, stuff. Thank you, Benoit. So today's objective uh, will be to see how can we get from a digital service to its environmental materiality. An environmental materiality is another way of saying its environmental impact, and it includes uh, not only uh, the, its carbon emission, but also uh, the, all of the other pollution and its usage of uh, renewable and non-renewable resources. To do this, we need to follow a process which is called environmental accounting. And uh, at Boavista, we have chosen to do it with uh, an open source approach. What is very difficult when you're doing uh, accounting, environmental accounting in the context of ICT is that you must take into account uh, all the value chain of your digital service, including the end user equipment, network, data centers, so all of the infrastructure that uh, your service uh, is uh, using. But you also need to take into account another dimension, which is the life cycle phases. So you don't want to only include the use phase, the impact of the use phase, but only the impact, uh, uh, but also the impact of manufacturing the equipment that uh, your service is running on, uh, transporting those equipment to their place of usage, using them, and also their, the end of life of the equipment. Today, we won't be able to dig in all of the di dimension. So you'll you see on the, um, on the slide what we're going to focus, but Boavista is working on all of the, all of the dimension here. It's still me. So why have we decided to do open source? So we are at FOSDEM. I think everyone here is convinced that we should do uh, all of uh, data and uh, development uh, with an open source process. But when we talk about environmental accounting, it's more f for us, it's uh, more specifically uh, important to follow an open approach. First, because we believe it's a democratic necessity. Uh, environmental figures are often used to, um, to justify political orientation. For instance, the Green New Deal is full of uh, environmental figures, and we believe that citizens should be able to criticize, audit, and criticize the figures that are being used to uh, make political orientation. Also, environmental figures and environmental accounting are used to label products and services, I think you might have seen some data centers who said that they are greener than, uh, than green. Uh, but to say this, you need to rely on figures, on environmental figures, and often those claims are not um, based on uh, open approaches and uh, figures, which is for us a problem since consumers cannot audit and criticize the figure. There is also a very more straightforward argument is uh, because today environmental accounting in the context of ICT is very immature. So the data that we use, the data that we report are uh, of very bad quality. To illustrate this, we've done uh, some work. Uh, we normalize the carbon impact of manufacturing one inch of a LED panel, so LED uh, uh, screen, and this is the impact for manufacturing one inch, the carbon, uh, the carbon footprint. Uh, and you see uh, from the five data sources that you have here, we have a magnitude of 10 between the lowest impact and the highest impact. We could think that uh, HP has a way better environmental friendly process than uh, Dell, but this is not the case. At least we, um, we, we, we cannot, uh, this is not the justification for th this difference. 
This difference is, uh, there is this difference because uh, all of those providers are not using the same data sources, the same hypotheses, and the same methods. And because all of those are not open, we are not able to uh, explain you why there is those difference. So open source should be a way, if all of those uh, figures were uh, based on open source approaches, we could uh, try to normalize those impact, compare the provider once again to another, and explain why, why different providers have different impacts. Uh, so let's first uh, focus on uh, the energy footprint. So uh, I guess the energy footprint is the, the part of the ICT footprint we mostly think about when we work in ICT. That's easier to, uh, to get a grasp on it. Uh, but as David said, uh, it's still, when we look at energy in ICT, it's still only uh, one part of the impact. Uh, so it's really about the usage phase. Uh, it doesn't cover the rest, which, is, which can be way, a way greater impact than just the usage phase. Uh, that's also true for data centers. In what I will present to you today, uh, most of um, the information are um, uh, accurate for data centers. Uh, some of them may be applied to an end user equipment, but we didn't include specific information on network equipment for technical reasons and also because it's hard to um, uh, get data on that part. Uh, so first, a little bit of context uh, regarding data centers. I don't know if you've seen the latest figures from the EEA. EEA is International a Energy Agency, and uh, it, let's say it's uh, a rather conservative organism uh, so far regarding uh, ICT environmental impact figures. But their latest figures is quite uh, enlightening because we can see that in 2022 we were around 400 terawatt hour of uh, energy consumed by data centers, which is uh, the double from what they uh, previously said for 2020, which is a bit strange. Uh, and also that uh, their projection for 2026, so in two years, um, uh, says that it will double again, so around 800 terawatt hours. Part of it is because of AI, but not only. Uh, you guessed it. So this is the context. We, what we can say here, at least, is that we are really in an hypergrowth um, uh, trend and not the opposite. Uh, that's not what we have seen in some medias like data centers, energy consumption is flat. That doesn't, that's not the case. Um, then wh what's the issue here actually? Wh wh what we want to look at? It's not just about the energy consumption, of course. Uh, I think I, I won't teach anything to anyone in this room when I say that energy consumption uh, means that we uh, at some point um, consume oil, gas uh, and coal uh, or other um, uh, energy sources. This will emit greenhouse gas emissions, of course, uh, but we will also consume water in the process. We will consume water for, uh, if we take into account the cooling of the data center, uh, and we will consume minerals and metals and other resources. Not, not all the resources that we can account for are listed on the, uh, on the draw, but uh, um, there are 16 at least uh, actually, there are 16 um, uh, environmental criteria uh, that we take into account in Boavista tools. Uh, so, what do you have in your position to uh, uh, work on your own energy consumption of the energy consumption of your services? Uh, so, we have talked uh, during the day in this room about perf and power top. Uh, there are other options as well. Of course, there are physical measurement devices, so smart PDUs, ID rack or ID low administration cards if you have them on your server, um, what matters in general. Uh, this is one way. The other way is software evaluation. So those are the options uh, that I've listed on the top. All of them are open source solutions. Um, if you are, let's say, in a bare metal uh, server context, you might choose Power API, Perf, PowerTop, Scaphandre. Uh, if you are in, a, let's say, more in a, a development phase of uh, software, you could use PowerJular. Uh, if you are in a Kubernetes context, Kepler or Scaphandre may, may help you. Uh, and if you are in a machine learning context, Code Carbon could be uh, of good help. And this, those are some examples. What's behind the scene is actually interfaces that have been mentioned uh, previously in the day. So NVIDIA SMI for uh, getting the energy consumption of GPUs, RAPL for uh, Intel or AMD uh, x86 uh, CPUs. Uh, 
And the, fir the third approach is modeling. So we could classify this as measurement. This is more about modelization. And some of those tools also use modeling then don't necessarily use only uh, measurement with those interfaces. Uh, and the BOST API is also part of it because it does modelize energy consumption and answers about uh, what the carbon composition of the electricity, what um, if I take the, the words from the previous presentation. Uh, but when we say that, we have to precise something, is that uh, uh, both hardware and software measurement uh, tools have their limits. If you take the wider purple and pink squares, they represent what a parameter uh, a physical device will be able to measure, so the whole machine actually, but you won't be able to zoom on what's the footprint of a software or a given component. On the other side, if you look at the uh, yellow and green screens, not so green, but um, <laughs> the, the, the smaller squ squares here, we see this is the perimeter that Rapel is able to measure. So a CPU, if there is a, an integrated GPU, uh, memory can be measured. For GPU, it's uh, SMIs. Uh, in some cases, you may have a broader um, perimeter in Rapel, uh, but this is for recent machines only. So we have an issue here because we are in a trade-off between completeness of the evaluation and uh, precision and the ability to zoom in on the footprint of one software, for example. And so how, so how could we uh, fix that situation? Uh, in in, in Boavista, we are launching a, a project called Energista, which is basically a collaborative science. This is a collaborative database um, that we open and we uh, propose voluntary organizations, individuals, to share um, uh, with an open source agent energy data and data about the hardware of the machine that has been uh, measured, which will help us to do statistics and then at some point produce better models uh, models that will help us improve software evaluation, um, um, software for ev power ev evaluation. Thank you, Benoit. So from the beginning of the presentation, we, we've told you that uh, the use phase and the energy consumption is not the only thing that should take into account when you want to account for the materiality of your service. And this is uh, where uh, the life cycle approach uh, comes in. So a life cycle approach will uh, try to take into account all of the phase of the life cycle of your service, but also all the impacts uh, well, uh, the most of the impacts of your um, criteria, so not only carbon footprint, but uh, depletion of uh, minerals uh, and the usage of water, for instance. We're going to focus here on, uh, the, on how can you uh, identify the environmental impact of uh, manufacturing a server, so it will be mostly in this area, but at Boavista we try to have a comprehensive um, uh, approach by uh, identifying the impact of all the phase from all the value chain. So this is a very, very uh, partial and simplified model on uh, how can you get the environmental materiality of a server uh, for a specific service. So a uh, first step that uh, we do when we do environmental accounting uh, is we try to identify what is the technical infrastructure that, is, that hosts the service. And this is often the most difficult part uh, because for instance, if you take a function as a service uh, that runs on AWS, it's very hard to know what is the specific consumption of resources uh, and what is the technical material that your function is running on. But we need this data to know uh, and to, uh, to understand what specific component is used and what is the impact of those components that we should allocate to the service. So this is some th sometime like archaeology when we need to dig and try to make some hypotheses to know how do we get from a service to its technical, stru technical uh, layer. But w once we have the technical layer, we need to go uh, to the raw material because this is where the impacts come from. So we try to uh, map all the processes that, um, that needs to be completed to uh, assemble and uh, build and manufacture a server. Uh, in a simplified way, we could say that uh, a, a server is a um, uh, an, assemb an assembly of plastic for the casing and, and components. 
so CPU, RAM, graphic, uh, graphical card, and so on. And a component uh, has uh, many process, but uh, the most impactful process is the packing process, when you pack uh, the, the die, the, the, it's the part of the component that is engraved, where you have the semiconductors. Uh, and for this, you need to have metal. And for uh, having the die, you need to engrave a, silic a silicium wafer. And so, as you can see, the process of engraving consumes a lot of water, and also you need metals to, uh, of course, uh, produce a silicium wafer. Across all of the um, all of this um, all of those processes, uh, there is the use of energy, which also will use uh, raw material, which will cause the pollution and resource depletions. So. Of course, you don't want, uh, each time you want to assess a service, we are not going to draw this map and uh, go to uh, uh, go until the usage of coal, oil, uh, and so on. So what we do is we factorize the uh, processes and we make them uh, easier to, um, to access through the different, um, the different tool we are building at Boavista. One main, main tool that we have is the Boavista API, which is an API that can make a translation between the ICT world with uh, IT people and the environmental impact. So you give, uh, to the, um, you give to the API a technical configuration. It can describe a digital service, an equipment, a component, and the API will uh, give you back uh, impact, environmental impact, not only on global warming, so not only on the carbon footprint, but uh, for instance, on other impacts such as prim primary energy that you should know if you know a little bit about energy, and abiotic depletion potential, which is a criteria that assess uh, the, mm, the, the removal of uh, non-renewable and uh, non-renewable non resources. So this includes uh, minerals and uh, fossil uh, resources. Uh, around the API, yeah, around the API, we built uh, so. Our architecture is in microservices, so the API is uh, a central microservices, microservice. But we have other uh, tools, such as Cloud Scanner, which will scan an AWS account and try to assess uh, with the API the impact of the AWS account. And we have also a pedagogical front end, which is called Data Vista, which uh, is based on the API, but it's just a nice uh, layer on top of the API for, for people who don't, doesn't want to to manipulate API. So for instance, here is a way to assess the impact of a server. And you, you, you see you can, um, you can configure a server. For instance, let's say that I have up one CPU. <laughs> Demo effect, or it's just, uh, I, okay, I put an L. <laughs> I can also change the location where I, where I use the server. So this will trace the, the carbon footprint of the electricity uh, where the, the, the server is running. So I invite you to, to play with uh, this tool and see a little bit uh, what is the main cause of the impact, both from the manufacturer uh, and the use phase. And also the manufacturing impact, you can have it by component, so it's also interesting to see which component is uh, most impactful. There is also other features such, uh, which are also in the API. Uh, you can assess the impact of uh, your cloud usage, for instance, or of uh, end user devices, uh, but we haven't introduced those during the, the, the talk. Yeah, the API is, you can scan the QR code and this will um, get you to the uh, repository of the uh, Boavist API. We wanted to open up this talk, so we begin by talking about energy, then we uh, took a broader approach with the life cycle approach, life cycle assessment approach, and uh, we wanted to open up with an um, even more systemic approach, which I call a systemic footprint, but uh, it's, uh, it could be also co called a consequential uh, approach. Yeah, from the beginning of the presentation, we'll talk, we've talked about the direct impact of a uh, digital service. So it means the impact of the value chain of the service. But maybe sometimes the most impactful uh, part of a digital service, it's not its direct footprint, but it is the indirect externalities, environmental externalities that is brought by the fact of deploying your service. Your service, you're doing your service for some usages and you need to be careful on why your service is used and how your service is used because this might be um, 
this service might be used to make environmental harm. Uh, so when you want to understand what is the consequences of uh, launching your service, you need to take another approach, which is a causal approach, and trying to map the different causes and consequences that, uh, are, um, that follow the introduction of your software. For instance, if you take a cloud provider, cloud uh, are known to be uh, often uh, more mutualized and more optimized in terms of energy, uh, energy usage and uh, carbon footprint. But since we have consumed, uh, si since cloud is very easily accessed, we are consuming way more compute uh, resources than we did before. So this is what we call the rebound effect, and this is something that we can get from a basic lifecycle analysis. We need to have a more systemic approach to, uh, to understand all of those societal transformation that is brought by ICT. And I think we're done. In. Thank you for your attention. We have seven minutes left for questions. Yes, it was very inter interesting, but so the problem is uh, that everybody must know this kind of thing for in collabor its collaboration to uh, climate, environment, and so on. And because there is no studies of Greenpeace about this kind of thing, about uh, energy provider, yes, in Belgium, but so this kind of thing is very uh, difficult of, uh, because so I know uh, that the tourists uh, uh, what is French? Hébergeur de site. I don't know in English. So I'm a, uh, Amazon Web Service. Yes. Yeah, so and this this kind of thing is very interesting for so their data centers. How it, its take of energy, if it's, its harm uh, effect on the rivers, on something like that. So uh, so all this kind of thing uh, uh, for the construction of a, of a computer and so on. Uh, I would like to have uh, that is an, an, uh, an uh, Greenpeace barometers of this kind of thing everywhere, so because it's very important for for our future. So also when the dissipate energy in a river, recuperation of energy, and so on. So your uh, remark is about awareness, I think. Yeah. So uh, there, there are, I think there is no report from Greenpeace, but there is a report from WWF, at least. And uh, I think the, the main purpose of Boavista and the tools that we're building uh, is not efficiency, but it's more making people aware of those problems and taking action, because I think, and I think we, we can, I can talk for both of us. We think that uh, having more IT uh, people engaged uh, is one way to, uh, to fight against uh, those, uh, this, this, uh, the impact of IT. Hello, thank you very much for this. Uh, when you were presenting the uh, server impact uh, thing, I have a technical question. There was a discussion about uh, joules uh, and primary energy as opposed to something that we might use like kilowatt hours, which is quite common. Could you maybe talk a little bit about why you chose that rather than a figure that we see used in lots of other places? Because that is something that I w found a little bit difficult to understand when I first looked at it. So primary energy versus secondary energy, if you could explain some of that and explain the decision to choose one versus what hours, for example, instead of joules. Yeah. You want to answer? Why do we express primary energy in joules? Yeah, well, I can say, but I don't know if it's um, an accurate answer, but in practical terms, um, joules are very used for very precise measurement purposes. Uh, most of the time when we talk about big figures, we are more about uh, watt hours, kilowatt hours, megawatt hours, and so on. Uh, what's its power, so it's not uh, expressed on a, on a, on a time frame. That, that has been said in a, in a previous talk. I don't know if it clarifies or... Yeah. Oh. oh, okay. Actually, I, I understand the confusion. Uh, primary energy is an impact criteria. Yeah. Secondary energy is a flow. 
So it's not considered the file line impact. So we use a second, uh, if you see here, let's say, uh, we, we can model the, the secondary energy, the, the power usage here in, in watts, and we use it to compute the, in the usage impact uh, for the difference impact retire. Primary energy is uh, how do you deplete Earth from uh, primary energy? Does it? Okay. Maybe your time for one. Maybe you can do both. So, okay. that, uh, uh, so, so the question is uh, because of some countries now don't want any more of uh, the, the the rubbish servers uh, fr from uh, our countries. The, the uh, data centers uh, change the policy in terms of management, for example, for the uh, uh, storage system. They, uh, at Google, they used to uh, break the, ha the, the, the hardware into small pieces, uh, not even recycling them at all. And uh, the, 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 were there uh, changes uh, recently for the, uh, for the spare part management? Because of the fact that countries don't want uh, to uh, to make the recycling anymore uh, of offshore countries. Actually, that's a, a very complicated topic.